Good afternoon, dear friends, and we're going on our online conference, and now we're in for the discussion. And the topic is new challenges for urban planning, the impact of the pandemic on city organi organization. Let me introduce our speakers, Sergei Kuznetsov, chief architect of Moscow, and uh, Marina Lipyoshkina, general director, director research territory development architecture. Today, and they're with me online, we have Michael Ko, Executive Fellow, Center for Livable Cities, and Tim Stoner, Managing Director, Space Syntax UK, and Maketa Kuta, Professor of Land Use Planning, Department of Built Environment, Alta University. And somehow, Maxim Lixutov, Deputy Mayor on uh, Transport, will join us. We all know that the year is difficult. The pandemic has changed our lifestyle, hopefully uh, temporary. There is a lot of discussion how the city environment will change. There are many theories and concepts, uh, which existed actually before the pandemic time. Uh, there are different reports how different cities have reacted and plan to react to uh, the new trends and the challenges we have because of the pandemic. Uh, many cities and towns uh, tend to be green cities and develop more green areas. Moscow uh, is the bench-making city here. Many Russian cities have a lot of green spaces, actually, and the question is how they are used. Speaking about the energy saving, resource saving, technologies uh, are also relevant and vital today. Despite the problems we have uh, lacking socialization, uh, we do move on. Uh, Sergey, the first question is for you. How will uh, the policy of this Moscow city change and will it change concerning planning, concerning some zones of the city development? Thank you so much. Uh, quite by chance, I've got slides for you, and we can start the slides. Uh, allow me just to say a few words. Uh, regarding the previous urban forum. Uh, the previous one was offline. And you probably remember that the urban health was uh, the topic of the forum. We had a lot of projects last year or so, before the pandemic, motivating people through the city environment to have uh, more energy uh, and to invest their health and energy into the city environment. And now we do uh, see that uh, all these healthy issues are good and relevant regarding the pandemic issues. Uh, uh, let me show the slides to you. Actually, they have a lot of in common what you saw last year and before that. Uh, so, my my topic is accessible environment, what changes uh, has the coronavirus brought to the city's development? Uh, well, uh, what is the major topic today? Innovation uh, is a famous Moscow project. And it includes uh, not only new apartments and more square meters, but also environment. On the map, you can see uh, where uh, uh, where the renovation is, uh, and the majority of Moscow areas are part of this map for changing. 
And this is the most important thing. You can see uh, the older blocks of flats which become parts of the new environment where more attention uh, is paid and more importance is attached uh, to lifestyle, to comfort, so that people could spend their time more comfortably. Service is also uh, very important, so the ground floors, uh, they house a lot of uh, cafes and infrastructure and also uh, some stadiums and places for jogging. Uh, let's look uh, in Prospekt Vernadskova and the changes there are uh, due to the format I've mentioned. This is what is being constructed now. So, step by step, we have a new infrastructure here. You can see that the uh, materials are of higher quality uh, and the architecture is of high quality. Uh, on the other hand, the project uh, is uh, quite good concerning the economy, uh, the Yauza River. And the embankment, uh, look here. Uh, the embankment is very long, um, and uh, this is what we have there today. A lot of kilometers. Lushniki, uh, the stadium, uh, also houses a great new designer project. So the river is the second important topic today, as well as uh, new routes for bicycles. You probably remember this map, but the idea is to fill the city with comfortable environment and uh, comfortable roads prepared for bicycles. Uh, one more project, the health of the city and Lushniki, the stadium. We started this project uh, earlier in the year 2018. We are finalizing it. You probably know some uh, buildings here. But uh, look at the environment. So many people can do sports there. I think I'm OK with the timing. Yes? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, but I have a question for you. Uh, you've uh, mentioned the quarterly construction. What are the principles? Uh, well, uh, actually, the whole uh, the idea started 50 years ago, and this is what we do now, quarter after quarter. But the principles change. Well, the principles uh, we had uh, 50 years ago have changed. I don't think we can uh, uh, call this uh, uh, quarterly construction, but zonage, uh, where there are different zones, so where the zones are subdivided into uh, the living areas and social areas uh, where people can fill privately, uh, where the uh, ground floors can be uh, developed into the public spaces. Uh, uh, it actually started in the 30s or 40s of the last century, but then that process stopped. I don't think uh, we've invented a will here. We're just developing, but there, there are new specific features. Uh, today, we have to construct more. We have new norms. We have new standards. Also, we have a legacy, and sometimes uh, not a positive one, uh, that uh, five-story blocks of flats uh, of the Soviet times. So engineering is important, but this is uh, not all. The whole team works uh, transport plus engineering um, and, uh, and the environment. We are trying to improve uh, the whole environment uh, in a complex, and uh, uh, this is, looks much better than before. Thank you so much, Sergei. And we are going on to Maxim Liksutov, who is with us now. We've discussed the public spaces and the construction. Could you please tell us, Maxim? Uh, 
Moscow really is the leader in public transport, and a lot of changes have happened. But we know that the transport department conducted a lot of questionnaires uh, in different regions. What else is necessary? How will the public transport system of Moscow change in five or seven years? Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, this uh, format of our urban uh, forum is quite unusual because we are used to see each other in the rooms physically. I hope this unusual format will not last forever because we are really glad to see all of your guests in Moscow showing to you how the public transport works. Uh, how it really works, you will see everything, you will try the uh, buses, the electro buses, uh, and, uh, the, uh, and the Vela roads. Actually, in Moscow, there are a lot of people who like uh, bicycles. Uh, and uh, we've been dealing uh, with this plan for a long time. Uh, Bikeways are popular. Unfortunately, it's impossible to do everything within one year. Uh, it depends uh, on the whole infrastructure uh, and also with the highways. But step by step, we go to the whole bikeways infrastructure, uh, which is not just pieces and uh, uh, separate uh, uh, bicycle paths. Uh, but uh, system for mobility, um, especially in the time of a crisis of the pandemic, uh, people have started to uh, to go out more. Uh, they have started uh, cycling more. Uh, they have started to use their uh, personal public transport uh, less. So this is a priority for us. Let me add one more thing. We've conducted a lot of audits uh, concerning the quality of our urban environment together with our uh, uh, doctors and medical doctors. Uh, and all the analysis uh, uh, by in all the labs say that our public transport uh, is safe. There was uh, no one proved uh, event uh, when uh, the virus uh, uh, was just going uh, in the transport. And the measures taken before the pandemic period played a major role. Yes, the public transport uh, lost uh, up to 70% of the passengers. But what we managed to do was the social dis distance, distancing. We started the new train Moscow 2020, and each car is uh, equipped with the automatic disinfection system, and this train uh, goes along uh, different metro line lines. So this is a metro train where uh, with the system of uh, disinfection inside, like in the operation uh, theater killing all the uh, disease microbes. We also uh, have a new project, a mobile help to the passengers. We did it before, but in some particular hours. Now, uh, starting from 5.30 in the morning until 1 p.m., uh, this service for people with uh, disability, if uh, they need help, uh, they can get it. Uh, and we have a special app which makes uh, this function automatic. And if a person with uh, a disability uh, goes uh, by metro somewhere, uh, they will be met. Electro buses. Uh, 550 electro buses uh, go along the streets of Moscow. Uh, uh, so 
in 2020, we've had new uh, buses, which became electro buses, and this is what we're going to develop further. Uh, the mayor of Moscow has taken this decision, and there is a decree already that starting from next year, Moscow will no longer buy a diesel uh, bus, but only electro bus. With improved and renovated uh, a railway station uh, and uh, also there was there will be a recreation zone on this on the north of Moscow next to the uh, northern uh, river boat station we have more personal cars, uh, about up to 130, 150,000 a day. But the mortality rate has decreased. Uh, this happened uh, thanks to the work of all my colleagues uh, and the whole Department of Transport, because we did our best to make our uh, roads safe. We also started the system uh, of uh, recognizing f f faces. Facial recognition system helps to make our system safe. And the next step, step will be the payment through this uh, facial recognition system. So the passenger enters the metro. Uh, there will be a scan scanning the passenger's face, uh, and the payment will uh, will go through uh, from the debit or credit card. So this is a revolutionary system. We are starting to test it, uh, and our staff members will be the first to test it, and uh, uh, after that uh, we'll launch it. The root cameras will also know how to look to see the passengers uh, with some health problems, with a heart attack, for instance, and we'll do our best so that uh, the system helps to give the care, uh, the emergency care to our pa passengers. Forbes uh, in London uh, awarded us for part of this system. And this is the mass system, mobility as a service system, which will unite all the uh, tran city transport in one mobile application. It will uh, launch uh, the route considering the preferences uh, of uh, each uh, passenger individual, uh, including uh, the underground and the public transport and the bicycle and everything. Uh, you will have a choice. Uh, the time uh, will be calculated uh, and we'll do our best so that the Moscovites uh, can choose uh, how they can go along Moscow uh, so that there are no borders concerning the routes or uh, payments. This is our target, that uh, every Moscovite or the visitor of Moscow can have less borders, no limits, and a lot of uh, a lot of church. Thank you for so for so long. I wanted to have as much information as I could. Thank you so much. Oh, Maxim, this has been a great and a complex presentation. Moscow is uh, an international leader today for uh, the public transport system. And I hope that Moscow will start sharing uh, nationally and internationally uh, things uh, the Moscovites uh, have in use already. Thank you so much. We expect novelties in the IT systems and modalities. And uh, I would like to give the floor to Michael Kaur. Michael is the executive fellow uh, for the Center for Libel Cities. But he will speak about Singapore. Singapore is top one in the rating for the quality of life 
we know that this rating is only for professionals who plan to move somewhere. And that is why the environment, the ecology are the basic indications here. So, Michael, could you please share with us how Singapore plans to uh, come to meet the challenges uh, by the pandemic? What are the plans uh, to develop the new environments and the new spaces? Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello from Singapore. Um, appreciate if I can just uh, answer your questions and respond through my slide presentation. Well, every city has uh, its challenges, its urban challenges. And in particular, Singapore as an island nation faces many, cha many challenges within its boundaries. Uh, next. Next. We are an island nation, limited resources, and we have to fit the requirements of a nation within our boundaries. Um, COVID-19 is but one of the many disruptions that Singapore has faced. We have been faced with other disruptions in the past and plagued with polluted rivers, open sewers, traffic jams, flooding. But next. But look at us today, 50 years down, we are now a global city, an endearing home. Next. We at the Center for Liberal Cities are very interested in tracking high density and highly livable cities. Next. But it comes to what we call the Singapore livability framework, because we believe that every city wants to achieve the key outcomes of high quality of life, competitive economy and sustainable environment. But it's how you get there that's really important. The systems approach through integrated master planning and development and dynamic urban governance. Next. The urban systems approach that we adopt towards infrastructure like transportation, waste, housing, all feeds back into achieving the key uh, quality outcomes for our citizens and our city. Next. Now taking an urban systems approach, for example, in terms of integrated master planning and thinking long term is a very important aspect towards Singapore's planning. We plan strategically on 10 year cycles through long term plans, such as what we call the concept plan on the right. We, this cascades down to the detailed master plan, which specifies land use, plot ratio, building height, fully transparent, available online for everyone. And it cascades down to further development plans on a local scale. Next. Next. Now the key plans for the key strategies that feed into this plan, firstly, are planning for polycentricity. We have always planned for decentralization since 1991 and fitted our, our regional centers and our housing new towns to what we call the MRT network. And it's shown in concept form on the left, a branching network with a circular uh, system that goes around the CBD. Next. And this is what it is today the many regional centers that are distributed with, together with local neighborhood centers and sub-regional centers around the island, providing opportunities for work, access to facilities and retail and learning facilities close to where you live. So you don't have to just come down to the CBD, but you can access uh, your facilities, regional centers, point uh, areas for learning right where you live. Next. Planning for high density and self-sufficient towns, a very important aspect for Singapore's planning, especially when 80% of our population lives in high density new towns. But each new town is planned to be self-sufficient with vibrant community spaces and retail and commercial spaces as well. Next. And this is what we mean by some of these neighborhood centers that you can see on the left, integrated with the green community facilities, retail, right in the heart of housing areas so that housing, residents can uh, attain very close access to it within say 15 minutes of cycle or even closer by walking and by public transport. 
Community facilities are located together, and this is an example here in our Tampines Hub, which has a library, performing arts facilities, sports facilities, a football field, and commercial and community, community facilities within its uh, form, its building form. So building high-density, self-sufficient towns with facilities easily accessible by the residents is a very critical planning issue. And it has been shown that this is very convenient, especially during COVID lockdowns, where people need to have these facilities close to where they are instead of having uh, to tr uh, travel long distances. Next. Health is the key aspect of city planning, uh, cleaning, the city or cleaning the nation, making sure that you have clean water, sewage uh, facilities all uh, planned for and integrated within a beautiful uh, setting. And you can see this, for example, in the second slide, whereby this uh, stormwater pond is actually integrated with parks and facilities. And the hospital that you see has got greens and urban farming within the building, and it's all integrated within the context of this green environment. Uh, promoting healthy living through walking and cycling has always been a key part of our plan because we have always tried to encourage active uh, activity and sports facilities and a sporting lifestyle for our citizens. Next. Distribution of health facilities throughout the island is very important. Uh, and we'd like to, I'd like to draw your attention now to the new model of an commu integrated community facility called Kampung Admiralty, which is perhaps even a two-minute city, because within its building form, you have uh, uh, housing for seniors, 55 years and above, healthcare facilities, recreational facilities, childcare facilities, commercial facilities, and plugged into the local transit station, all in one building. Next. Planning for green and blue spaces, a very important aspect uh, for green relief, for having a green environment for both our uh, activities as well as for our own mental uh, uh, well-being as well. And not only do we have parks on a regional scale, on a neighborhood scale, but we encourage the green to also permeate through the buildings in skyrise greenery. And this always comes back to the leadership vision by our first Prime Minister, Lee Kuan Yew, who believed that we should not have a concrete jungle because it destroys the, heaven, the human spirit, and we need greenery of nature to lift our spirits. Next. So this is the green and blue plan that you see, and 90% of residents will live within 400 meters of a park by 2030. So what you can see is some of the parks, uh, the top one being actually a park that is designed also as a floodplain. It can actually accommodate the stormwater runoff during times of heavy rainfall. Next. Now underlying this is the key horizontal of technology as an enabler. Uh, trace together apps, for example, especially during this COVID period, whereby we need to do community contact tracing, safe entry app. But interestingly enough, other apps like Space Out, Safe Distance at Parks, which actually facilitate uh, the citizens' uh, access to data to show if these areas are crowded and they can make their decision of whether they want to go shopping at a shopping center or to go to a park, depending on the crowdedness of these facilities. Next. Now, another underlying horizontal is bringing the community on board. Because if you don't, if they don't activate the trace together, we can't do community tracing. If they don't participate and contribute the ideas, we cannot improve our systems for the future. And we found that even during this COVID period, we are able to engage the community through Zoom and virtual, uh, uh, virtual platforms. And the community is willing to participate and give their ideas. Next. Please look at our publications, they're all available at clc.gov.sg for us to share with you and share experiences and also for you to share your knowledge with us. Next. And we'd like all of you to be invited to the World City Summit 2021 happening in June next year. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Komar. We'd hope that 
We will have an opportunity to come to you in 2021, although everything is so unpredictable. We'll hope that uh, vaccination will be of help and that at least uh, in summer next year we can travel as much as we did before. And saying that, we'd like to pass the floor to Tim Stoner, Managing Director of uh, Space Syntax. Mr. Stoner, your professional career is related to studying behavior, communication of people in the urban environment. We know that uh, the lockdown undermined our behavior. How will the urban planning react to these new challenges? Will there be any consequences of COVID-19 remaining after this year and a half of the pandemic? Or probably the people will change their behavior patterns and probably would use certain spaces more actively and would refrain from other spaces, for instance. Thank you so much. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Sergey, I, I wish I was in Moscow with you all, and hopefully next year we will see each other together in the same room. I'd like to address, thank you, your questions uh, by starting with the idea that cities are machines for human interaction, and we really need to value them for that reason post-COVID. And we have cities because we need to interact for social, for economic, and for cultural reasons. But not all cities work as machines, as efficient machines. There are good cities and there are bad cities. And in fact, most cities today are a mix of both. Good cities are highly efficient machines. They create social and economic interaction. And they do it with very low impacts on the natural environment. Good cities are walking and cycling cities with strong public transport networks, as we just heard. Bad cities do the opposite. They're dependent on cars. And so we need to be careful that when we talk about cities, we understand which type of city we're dealing with, the good or the bad city. And to do that, we need to be able to measure the difference between one and the other. And this is the mission of me and my colleagues at Space Syntax, building computer models to measure the performance of cities and then using those computer models to create plans for walkable, dense and connected cities. Because cities have suffered throughout their history, they've suffered from fire, from war, from diseases like cholera, and they've always been rebuilt to protect them against fire, to clean the water, as we heard, and to rebuild after devastation. COVID is different. COVID is not spread by water, but by human proximity. And this presents, I think, a big challenge for us, because if we avoid human proximity, we fundamentally undermine the essential function of cities. And without cities, we're not human. So if we're going to go back to being human, physical proximity, we need a vaccine. And even when we have vaccines, we have to remember we now have other options for human proximity. We have digital options because we've learned to live with Zoom, with Teams, with Skype. And indeed, arguably, we've developed some new methods of human interaction that we didn't have in cities before. And this raises, I think, a really important question. Can we learn to live without cities? But I think the simple answer is no, because for all of its benefits, digital connectivity does not replace physical proximity. And the key reason that digital is inferior, I think, is because of what happens in physical meetings. And that is the informal interaction between people, the things that were unplanned, the people you bump into when you go to a meeting, when you're in the street outside the meeting, the new ideas that emerge from 
those unexpected things that happen in the physical world. Digital tools just don't provide the same context. The call starts, the call finishes, there's no informal interaction. Serendipity is the magic dust of cities, and that's why I think we always will need them. But we can't always assume that when we get the vaccine and go back to our cities, that this serendipity will happen automatically. And I think this is because before COVID, many of our cities were substandard. The serendipity machine was not working well. These car, these car dependent cities were not making the best that cities can offer. And what is the best of cities? Well, we've heard already from Sergey, it's about walking, cycling, public transport, congestion free streets, clean air, shade, shelter from the wind, protection from seasonal and freak flooding, as we just heard from Michael in Singapore. Buildings that meet the ground, give something back to the ground plane. In other words, cafes, restaurants, shops, and galleries, not blank walls of cold stone or sheets of polished glass, as so many of my architect colleagues like to give. Instead, we need the serendipity machine. Unfortunately, that means a lot of refit of existing cities. Um, think about the business trip that we used to make. If that's in a car to an air-conditioned bunker, back to a hotel in a car, back to a, an airport in a car, that's the serendipity machine broken. If instead, the business day begins in a public space with a cup of coffee, it moves by walking to the next meeting, and it's lived and played out in the public spaces of the city. If offices are open, not labyrinthine and cellular, if people genuinely have a buzz in the place they work, then the serendipity machine is working and we will not go back to, to Zoom and to Teams. So the changes we need to make to our lives must not only be short-term ones about whether we have hand gel, but they need to be the long-term ones about do we have the right cities to attract talented people? Do our cities foster innovation? And after all, with increased automation, increased robotization, the jobs that matter are the jobs that machines can't yet do. They're the jobs that support the innovation industries, the design industries, and not just the design of buildings and space, but the design of finance, the design of governance. So in summary, Interaction, innovation, and serendipity are, for me, the three words that we should look for. And how do we achieve interaction, innovation, and serendipity? It's through walking, cycling, and public transport. And this will help us remind ourselves that cities are there to help us be human. The coronavirus is a, a great and deadly plague. If it has a silver lining, it's this, it's given us pause for thought, to remember what we've truly missed in, about our cities, and therefore what we should be building more of in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim, for such a very inspiring, inspirational pitch. And uh, saying that, I'm passing the floor to Marina Lepeshkina, who is with us here in the studio. Mega policies on mega cities are usually associated with their inconvenient uh, conditions in terms of a mental comfort or such as uh, noise uh, interference, uh, noise waste, etc. Your company did a research as to how to design big cities, major cities from the standpoint of a psychological comfort and convenience for the citizens. In your opinion, what is the main criteria for the psychological comfort? How can we provide for that? In mega policies, how we can make the living conditions even better? We looked at the cases of Nur Sultan or Astana, of Singapore and Moscow in essence. 
What can we do about Moscow to make it even more convenient? Thank you so much for this, your question. Really, the topic of our psychological comfort and convenience was raised when we discussed that uh, at the conference of a comfortable city, when we realized that uh, physical health, this is only a component of the overall health of a person. And mental health is also very crucial. Mental health is defined by a number of criteria, such as, uh, for instance, reaction of a person to some irritants and uh, the WHO recognized uh, mental health as one of the main factors for all the residents. The residents. Amid the pandemic, we see that uh, actually it was recommended to, to be less nervous, not to be so anxious, because uh, nervous and anxious people would uh, fill the beds in hospitals, although they didn't have any COVID uh, positive tests uh, just because of uh, the nervous breakdowns. Uh, people have to bear in mind that uh, the difference is the same as uh, just doing some exercise and doing professional sports. Usually the rate of noise is very high in uh, the cities and we are living not a natural way of life and this is also a component of the urban life. All the phobias and depressions uh, evolve much faster in the city. You lose your bearing in this city, uh, and this is very typical of a city, especially when their planning is not good. A person no longer associates himself with a certain place or certain location. And uh, social s stress is uh, on the rise. We know such cases very well. According to the research, we realize that uh, the uh, city residents uh, react uh, um, more painfully to uh, certain stresses, and uh, they do not uh, inform the police about certain grave cases, so they have less social responsibility, and they don't want to know people around them. What are the factors which bring more stress to our life? Video ecology, this is a very well-known factor, one homogeneous uh, visual field certainly impact the mental health of a person. And we know lots of cases when the people from uh, the districts uh, which are marked by aggressive uh, outlook of uh, the buildings, they have to go to downtown and just to have something for their eyes to rest. So it means that uh, people living in a city are always anxious, always alarmed, and uh, the residents of megapolises or mega cities have a very muted or subdued perception of the life. They uh, use more reason than feelings when they act, and uh, they have no public control, which uh, certainly impacts their mental health. So this topic is far from being new, and in our research we used a study done by Ms. Dridze in 1960s uh, when massive construction started. Kevin Lynch in the United States coined such terms as the ways and roots uh, of movement of uh, man, the districts actually. These are the areas where uh, a man would feel himself or herself uh, a part and parcel of um, the environment. This is part of the psychology of a person. What are the normal living conditions and how we can create them? Safety and security, this is what a person would be looking for in any situation and in a city. It would be a room or a territory <laughs> where a person would understand that the boundaries not necessarily are the fences, but this is something tangible. A person has to be capable of predicting the future. When people lived in caves, they tried to anticipate certain dangers. Then another thing, uh, curiosity. Uh, probably it contradicts uh, safety and security, but people are curious, so they have to change the picture in front of their eyes. That's why people suffer it a lot when you couldn't um, go farther one, one kilometer away from your 
building because actually all the buildings look the same. Some orderly uh, way of life. You have to keep your bearing in this city to have some milestones or some hallmark uh, uh, buildings in front of your eyes. Moscow follow that way. So there are totally recognizable buildings, uh, recognizable districts, and uh, the planning for certain districts are quite unique. It's quite unique. And uh, as we have discussed, uh, people don't have to go to the city of Moscow to have some rest or to walk around. People would go not to see the business or, uh, centers, but would go to parks. And uh, Moscow offered a very interesting project on increasing the greenery in this city. Uh, sexual comfort is created by the greenery, just like um, Singapore with its uh, green and blue plan. Um, has to make sure that a person would uh, um, have a park uh, at least one kilometer away from his home. And therefore, we want to have some mental rest in the areas for the rest. Therefore, what echoes the presentation which we heard in the very beginning about the natural territory personalization of the environment. So, for instance, we may say that uh, Moscow offered a very popular demand, a uh, 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 very popular service, when you can rent uh, a piece of garden and plant something and take care of your plants, uh, which is very relaxing. We have to protect the cities of uh, different noises and uh, light impact, uh, although we cannot uh, put any blackout curtains or noise proof or soundproof or screens. And we have to be very caring about the natural landscapes. Thank you so much, Marina. That was a very interesting and comprehensive presentation. Thank you for mentioning such a really very important trend as gardening, or farming, city farming, and uh, urban farming probably will be one of the most demanded for type of activity. So it doesn't mean that we'll see goats and cows in the streets of the cities, but this opportunity, this possibility to get out of your a house and to do something about the yard, courtyard. And we really know that uh, there is a whole movement around the globe uh, which is being supported by the local authorities. Um, for instance, there is a flowering case in Moscow, some local projects which are very helpful to engage people into these kinds of activities. This is not just about beautifying, but uh, rather about uh, uh, somehow feeling yourself comfortable and convenient uh, psychologically there. I'm personally flew to Marketa Kuta, Alta University. Marketa, good afternoon. Today we spoke mainly about uh, mega policies such as Moscow, Nur Sultan, Singapore. Alta University is located in a Finnish city, very cozy, small cities. How do you work? Uh, you have developed a very interesting methodology. Uh, you are working with some urban spaces. What you managed to do and uh, how this experience can be replicated uh, in other countries. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can see my slide. Can you? Yes. Mm, I'm going to talk to you today about participatory planning, actually. And you probably know that there are many countries, including my country, Finland, where participatory planning is actually uh, compulsory in all uh, planning cases. Uh, and even if we have that legislation, there has been lots of issues in realizing the spirit of the law. Uh, because um, there are typical, it's very typical that even if you try to arrange participatory planning, uh, only a handful of people 
end up participating, timing is too late, the knowledge produced is not influential, and as a whole, the process is very demanding for all partners. So what is quite typical in Finland in, and in many other countries is that public hearings are the most common uh, participation techniques, but there are problems with this one. Uh, many people in these events are not, uh, do not have courage to raise their hands and express their views. Of course, now during the pandemic, you cannot arrange these kind of events. You cannot even uh, arrange topic group meetings, which are or also very typical participatory planning uh, method. Instead, um, you can uh, arrange online participation. And that's what my team has been doing. Uh, let me just still say that um, in traditional participation events, the knowledge produced is typically in, in a format like this. And what is often happening is that nobody goes systematically through the knowledge produced. It's not saved anywhere in a systematic form, so the usage will be very difficult. So my, my team has developed uh, online uh, participatory uh, mapping methods that we now call Mapsioner uh, methods that actually these methods has, have been used in Finland in most of the cities already and, and also in other countries, actually more than 30 countries, including cities of New York, Denver and so on. And here uh, we are talking about a uh, simple to use tool. Anybody can create a map based survey at, that then can be used either in in face to face meetings or you can use your own um, computer, of course, at home or you can use your mobile devices and um, you can collect large um, data sets from thousands of people rather easily. And the, the um, knowledge produced uh, is typically in uh, point, uh, root or area format. And as a whole, you uh, can produce really uh, fascinating new kind of uh, data based for participatory planning. Let me just uh, tell you about one example. Uh, in Helsinki master plan, plan process, uh, we use this method and about um, uh, 3,700 respondents uh, were participating in uh, online survey and produced about uh, 33,000 place markings um, and, and wonderful data. And with the help of this data, uh, we were able to produce new kind of knowledge uh, about, in this case, where people consider good places for new, uh, new infill projects and where you shouldn't um, build anything. And we were also able to diff identify different resident viewpoints. There were actually conflicting viewpoints. Some people wanted to develop certain areas and other people want, wanted to uh, support the sa very same areas. So it was easy to differentiate these kind of conflicting viewpoints and areas. And finally, it was possible to compare the views from citizens expressed via these map surveys with the plan proposal. And we could estimate that the fit between plan proposal and the view by people uh, was something like 75% match in the plan proposal phase. And after this, of course, another huge uh, public debate took place. And in the final plan, the match grew up to 87%, which wasn't bad at all in my view. 
this kind of data, this soft geographic knowledge that people can produce can be easily integrated to cities um, data storage systems to guarantee the uh, influential use of the knowledge produced by people. Let me finally just mention that this method uh, has been used in, number, in, in research projects concerning a variety of themes. And now we have also studied um, uh, how people, the use of um, different urban spaces by people have changed during a COVID pandemic. We happen to have a very nice baseline data. We approached same people who had already produced data about their everyday life, place-based, and we asked again how they are using uh, spaces now during a pandemic. And we have already found out that, the, for example, the use of green areas increased significantly. But we are going to realize a third step still, uh, go back to these same individuals after pandemic and find out whether any of the lessons learned during pandemic uh, have has stayed uh, and become permanent habit. That will be a very interesting research question that we can answer hopefully soon. This was all from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Marketa, thank you so much for your very interesting pitch because really to make a city psychologically and physically convenient and comfortable, certainly people have to participate in the designing. It should be a participatory a planning approach and following the case of Moscow, we now we have uh, such a participatory process called Active Citizen Project, where people may make their own proposals, where people are engaged in the decision making. All these cities have their own unique experience, and certainly and the exchange of views and best practices always is very helpful in order to develop our mechanisms to come up with very interesting results. I'd like to thank all our speakers for today. First of all, thank you so much for very interesting presentations and systemic view. Secondly, thank you so much because we are right on time, which is not a simple task. As all the speakers have stressed, the pandemic only highlighted what we spoke before the pandemic. We need more time and uh, more efforts uh, to apply to our public spaces, uh, the ones which are arranged not only for the aesthetics, but uh, most importantly, public spaces is something where we are doing sports, we're spending time. We have to provide for the symbiosis between the work and private life. We have to pay a lot of attention to different spaces uh, to redesign them, proceeding from the challenges put forward by the pandemic. Thank you so much, dear panelists, and uh, see you at our next session. Thank you so much.